Brevemente voy a, a presentarles, a, a, a deciros quién son cada uno de ellos y eh, cuál es el título de, de su charla. Eh, no, ¿En qué orden lo vamos a empezar? You first. Uh, bueno, pues como tengo delante a Costis, pues eh, empezamos por él. Costis Kajimi Jalis actualmente trabaja en el Departamento de Geografía de la Universidad de Jarocopion de Atenas, del que es catedrático emérito. Costis hace investigación en geografía radical económica, economía política y desarrollo regional, con numerosas publicaciones al respecto. Su proyecto actual es la geografía marxista y específicamente el desarrollo geográfico desigual. Su libro más reciente se llama Espacios de crisis, estructuras, resistencias y solidaridad en el sur de Europa. En él deconstruye el mito de que la deuda, tanto pública como privada, sea solo el resultado de las costumbres derrochadoras de los países del sur de Europa y ofrece nuevas perspectivas y materiales económicos e ideológicos sobre la crisis económica y los espacios donde se despliega. Creo que este será su, el tema de su charla y, aunque tomará ejemplos, aunque me, me insistió en que tomara ejemplos del sur de Europa, pero su intención es hacer un relato más amplio. Yo creo que paso, por tanto, la palabra directamente a Costes y luego ya me presentamos a Andy Merrifil. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, can you hear me? Um, uh, before I start, I would like to thank a lot uh, the organizers of this very important conference. And I don't see only colleagues in the room, but also comrades. And I think it's uh, quite unique, and uh, I feel very good about it. So my talk is about uh, the spatiality of uh, uneven development. Uh, as you may know, uh, uneven development is a Marxist concept. But uh, Marx uh, did not say a great amount about it. Although he did, of course, uh, wrote a lot about uh, unevenness and inequality in terms of the accumulation process and the competition among capitalists. He argued in Capital Volume 1, and I quote, that capital grows in one place to huge mass in a single hand because it has in another place been lost by many. More broadly, uh, this implies that uh, peripherality and underdevelopment is not simply the result of uh, places being left out, but it is actively produced so that some regions gain at the cost of others being losers. Marx grasped only some of the importance of uneven development. He expected that the world market would largely homogenize towards global levels, and questions of development uh, will uh, find a way out. A position fathered by Rosa Luxemburg, who expected that when the capitalist system had expanded into any geographical corner of the earth, its expansion will necessarily end and socialism will follow. It was Lenin, however, who most explicitly recognized the advent of uneven development proper when he argued that henceforth economic expansion will not take place in concert with territorial expansion, that is colonialism, but as an internal redifferentiation of an already conquered world. Leon Trotsky proposed, proposed in 1920 a law of uneven and combined development, which explored the political possibilities and constraints of constructing socialism directly out of feudal society. Trotsky's contribution helped to show that different countries may advance to a large extent independently from each other, but at the same time did not exist in complete isolation. They are interdependent, 
that is the combined uh, term, through processes of cultural diffusion, trade, political and religious relations, and various spillover effects from one country to another. All the above treatments of uneven development were offsprings of 19th and early 20th century philosophical tradition that characterized by the subordination of space to historicism, a major constraint responsible for the subordination of space in social theory in general. Although great difference marks, marked the writings of 19th century Marxist thinkers, their views collectively supplied a very rich foundation of Marxist theory of geographically as well as historically uneven development. However, the basic motor behind uneven development was for them coincidentally historical. The making of history through process of capital accumulation and the unfettering struggles of social classes. The spatiality and the geography of those processes were an external environment and was little more than un an unnecessary complication, as Marx himself wrote. Only in the early theories of imperialism it will be resurrected later to assist in the reaccession of space in Marx's thinking, but this was more an act of desperation rather than inspiration tapping into the few areas of modern Marxism where Marx uh, think that space and geography seem to matter. And as Foucault said, for this period, space, and I quote, space was treated as the dead, the fixed, the undialectical, the immobile. Time, on the contrary, was richness, fecundity, life, dialectic. Theories of imperialism and Trotsky's combined development, and even at combined development, inspired in the late 60s and 70s, as all of you know, dependency and development of underdevelopment theories. In these explanations, uneven development is effectively identified as the key outcome of the capitalist process itself as the outcome of the accumulation process, capital mobility and fixity, the circulation of value. And in these readings, the unit of analysis is the country and the spatiality is limited within the boundaries of the country or across different countries. The dominant spatialization was that of core and periphery, sometimes semi-periphery, and states compete through trade and change hierarchical positions in the international division of labor as time passes. All of the above approaches treated space primarily as a physical container, the sum of places of production and consumption, the territory of different markets, places that simply supply raw material and industrial places that process them the source of the crude friction of distance to be annihilated by time and the increasing unfettered operations of capital. Space was reduced to the dead-ended product of ordering, the relativity of location, the statistical covariation, and the axioms of geometry. An important but often neglected contribution to the development of Marxist spatial analysis can be found in the work of Antonio Gramsci. His analysis of Italy's uneven development, particularly in the barkness of Mesogiorno and its relations in northern Italy, urban development in Turin, the housing question, and the difficult alliance between urban and rural proletariat was a strong effort to focus attention upon the political, cultural, and ideological dimensions of capitalism against the prevailing economic economism of the time. Of special importance is his elaboration on the role of modern capitalist state and his imposed, imposed territorial division of labor. 
Cramsey, in his emphasis on the assemble of social relations, which comprise a particular social formation, a term provided many years later by Althusser, concretizes the abstraction of the mode of production in time and space, in history and geography, in a specified conjunctural framework which became the necessary context for revolutionary action. A spatial problematic was not explicitly raised as such, but its foundation was clearly evident in the spatial relations embedded in the social formation of Italy and in particularities of the place. The step from Gramsci to Lefebvre is primarily one of explicitness and emphasis regarding the spatialization of uneven development. Lefebvre, like Gramsci, fought consistently against dogmatic and reductionist interpretations of Marxism, and his writings are marked by the persistent search for a political understanding of how and why capitalism has survived all his internal crises from the era of, from the era of Marx to the advanced state-managed capitalism and to the financial capitalism of today. His answer is the very known thesis that uh, many of you spoke uh, this morning in the previous session about the social production of space. And I remind you uh, a small passage from the survival of capitalism where he argues, and I quote, capitalism has found itself able to attenuate, if not resolve, its internal contradiction for a century and consequently in the hundred years since the writings of the capital, and it has succeeded somehow growth. We cannot calculate at what price, but we do know the means, by occupying space, by producing space. Lefebvre links this advanced pr production of space to the scale question and he underlines that the reproduction of the social relations of production takes place from the scale of everyday life to the planetary urbanization. They are reproduced in a concretized and created spatiality that has been progressively occupied by advancing capitalism. Lefebvre was not a theorist of uneven development, but he defines an encompassing spatial problematic in capitalism and raises it into the central position in general social theory. In this respect, he has been a key figure helping to make space and geography a far more central component of the theoretical framework of uneven development, wherein uneven spatial development is less an outcome and more an integral constitutive element of capitalist mode of production. Human geographers, such as David Harvey, Neil Smith, Ed Soja, Milton Sanders, and many others, took further the concept of space as a social construct, starting to develop on a theory of uneven geographical development, which according to Harvey is still incomplete. Harvey, especially with his magisterial account to the limits of capital, with further development by Neil Smith in his concept of CISO theory of uneven development, provided a way of uh, thinking to grasp the dialectical relations between growth and decline in particular regions and places. Before them, the French economist Christian Palois and Alain Lipietz and the Belgian economist Ernest Mandel added an important spatial element in the theorization of uneven development. The contradiction of equalization and differentiation of the conditions of production and reproduction. The very existence of capitalism presupposes the sustaining presence and vital instrumentality of spatially uneven development as outcome of the inherent differences in the rate of profit among firms, sector, and places. 
So there is a clear tendency for continuous reproduction of unevenness across firms, sectors, and regions. And as Mardell argued, and I quote, if the rate of profit were always the same in all firms, sectors, and regions, in all countries of the world, then there will be no more accumulation of capital under that than made necessary by demographic movement. And this is inconsistent with capital's nature, and as Harvey said, that capital surely will stagnate. At the same time, however, there is a persistent tendency towards increasing equalization of the rate of profit and the reduction of difference across sectors and regions. This derives from competition among firms, the spatial diffusion of technology and innovation that tend to equalize the rate of profit due to the ability of capitalists to adapt always to new conditions. Equalization derives also from state intervention to improve the conditions of production, for example, through the construction of infrastructures and the provision of incentives and protectionism, and improving conditions of social reproductions across regions. Inequalization, however, proved to be temporary, either because capitalist success in particular places cannot sustain forever, or because the support provided by the state eventually became devaluated. The spatiality of the contradiction, equalization, differentiation help us to move forward, to take on board the whole motion of value over space. Processes of production, valorization, circulation, and realization of value do not happen in the space less head of a pin, but into differentiated and uneven created spatiality. Hence, a geographical transfer of value takes place as a process through which a part of the value produced in one location, area, or region is realized in another, adding of, to the receiving region local accumulation base. This transfer operates, operates first indirectly through the operation of the capitalist market itself when exchange takes place among unequal partners in terms of capital intensity, productivity, labor conditions, and the like. Second, directly through the intervention of social agents, such as the state, or particular acting firms, such as the human decision of the brain train of the young people uh, living in Southern Europe to go to the north, or for the debt payments from one social entity to another. The dominant geographical scale at which the contradiction of equalization differentiation operates and the geographical transfer of value occurs has been changing over time. And even spatial development not only occurs at different spatial scales, but also is itself intimately bound up with the production and reproduction of geographical scales. Thus, uneven spatial development entails a fundamental restructuring of the geographical scales that frame and are framed by the production, valorization, circulation, and realization of how of value. How then we can operationalize this general framework to understand the current crisis in Southern Europe and the persistent uneven development across Europe and the European Union? And how can we convince other comrades to appreciate space in their analysis and actions beyond its crude use as physical container? Together with others in Southern Europe, I use a version of Marxism that goes beyond the iron laws of capital accumulation to consider the role of the state and institutions at different scales, including meta-governance such as the European Union, and interventions by a multiplicity of social agents, including political parties, social movements, 
personalities, all the above overarched by the analytical lenses of ideology, culture, class, and gender. In other words, what is central in investigating the motion of value, in particular social and spatial formations, and not in abstracto. Our southern peripheral positionality vis-a-vis -vis the birthplaces of capitalism was in a contradictory way both a constraint and a window of opportunity. This is because catching up was not applied only in development theory, but also in the significance of language and the production of knowledge. Soon we realize that the political economy tools coming from other language discourses and other capitalist histories could not grasp the complexities of our societies. We were lucky enough to rely on the Gramscian and the Lefebvrean tradition, and I will add Fernand Brodel and the Annal schools, as well as Nikos Pulazzas, Salvador Giner, Massimo Pazzi, Arnaldo Bagnasco, Maria Todorova, Constantinos Tukalas, and many others, who helped to develop a particular Southern critique. In this tradition, our Marxism Consequently, our theory of uneven spatial development, besides studying classical processes of capital accumulation, value motion, and the labor capital conflict, gives homologous attention to what we call the residuals of grant narrative. This includes, among many others, of course, the informal economy and small firms, statism, clientelism, and patronage the role of land and land rent, extended families, cultural, gender, and ethnic variations, and above all, space as a social construct, always uneven, built in to all scales from everyday life to the European scale and beyond. In this respect, I argue that the rising public debt was one of the crisis effects rather than the cost during the last 10 years. In contrast, for me, the causes of the crisis lie in the combination of the long durée of uneven spatial development in Europe, the uneven and undemocratic structure of the Eurozone, and the introduction of the Euro, which was the fragile and explosive background upon which the global financial crisis was grounded and hit its first weak link, Greece. The building of the Eurozone was in fact the production of a new hybrid space scale in the context of capitalist transformation towards financialization and the switch to rent sinking activities, particularly speculative real estate and accumulation through dispossession. The absence of any spatial and regional perspective in the Eurozone proposals with the exclusive focus on the national convergence criteria was a major mistake. Consequently, in coming to terms with the crisis, this monoscalar view of the world was very soon revealed as inadequate. In understanding why the crisis came about, so in principle how it needs to be tackled, I argued that this sole preoccupation with the national scale needs to be challenged and attention given to spatially uneven development, uneven trade flows and trade imbalances that accumulate surpluses in the north central regions and deficits in the southern ones that later evolve to public debt. Furthermore, the undemocratic and authoritarian character of multi-scale governance and the Eurozone exacerbated the effects of the crisis and precluded any effective measures to deal with the reluctant problems. In brief, the causes of the crisis are located in the political economy of spatial development, processes that are inherent into capitalist development and that has been in place for decades but that were given a savage added twist by the introduction of the Euro and new forms of regulations in the Eurozone, and further intensified by the austerity policies imposed across Europe and directly by the Troika 
as in Greece and Portugal. I'm sure that many comrades do not agree with this reading of the crisis. They don't see space as a social construct and they don't believe that all kinds of social relations and relations of production are both space forming and space contingent. Moreover, they don't realize how space can be made to hide consequence from us, how relations of power, exploitation and discipline are inscribed into the apparently innocent spatiality of social life and how human geographies became filled with politics and ideology. In this respect, in addition to our struggle for changing current conditions of authoritarianism, austerity, and exploitation at home and in the European Union, we need a parallel effort to reassert spatiality into the minds of the Marxist left, which is really highly needed. Thanks for your attention. Pues, pues muchas gracias, Costis. No sé si hay alguna eh, palabra, alguna pregunta en la sala. O, o las dejamos para después las dos. Vale. Bueno, pues entonces pasamos a la intervención de, de Andy Merrifield, que es un ensayista y universitario marxista, especializado en geografía y urbanismo. Eh, graduado en, en Geografía, Sociología y Filosofía. Eh, ha sido profesor en varias universidades en, en Londres y también en Estados Unidos. Escritor político que ha seguido o, o ha estado en torno a, a, a las ideas del efebre como el derecho a la ciudad o las políticas de encuentro. Eh, ha publicado muchos libros y muchos artículos en New Left Review, The Nation y otras muchas revistas. Eh, en 2008 publicó con gran éxito el libro The Winston of Donkeys y su último libro es De qué hablamos cuando hablamos de ciudades y amor, eh, de, en el 2018. El título de su charla de hoy es Metro Marxismo 200, y tratará, deduzco, de nuestro intercambio de correos sobre lo que el marxismo puede ofrecer hoy para entender la dinámica de la ciudad y para inspirar políticas urbanas progresistas. Se hace varias preguntas, como las siguientes. ¿Puede el marxismo comprender aún la dinámica de las ciudades de hoy en día que parecen estar basadas en la extracción, en hacer que el suelo pague? ¿Puede el marxismo aún inspirar la disidencia radical, una política de la ciudad que lucha por la justicia y el goce? ¿Qué es una verdad marxista en nuestra era de la posverdad? Eh, su ponencia explora estos temas y sugiere que un metromarxismo dialéctico ofrece la manera más fructífera de investigar la ciudad y de enmarcar cualquier posible política progresista. En su obra homónima de 2002, rastreaba el discurso urbano marxista a través eh, de más de un siglo, desde Marx y Engels a Benjamin, Lefebvre, Debord, Castells, Harvey o Berman. En conjunto de intelectuales con pensamientos bastante distintos sobre la ciudad, pero todos ellos con un hilo que parte de Marx. Dejo, por tanto, a Andy que, que piense con Marx ahora y le agradezco también su participación en este congreso. Thank you, Teresa, for the very nice introduction. Uh, of course, I probably won't answer any of those questions uh, that I said. Um, in my talk, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to say a few things about Marxism in the city. Am I talking too loud? It's, uh, I've got a lot of echo here. Is that okay? I'll try to uh, talk a little bit slow. I, I tend to talk rather than lecture or read, so I hope that the, uh, the translator is going to pick it up because I have an accent as well, but uh, to my English, coming from Liverpool. So... What I want to talk about a little bit is this link between Marxism and the city. And I guess when I was invited to come here to participate in this, uh, this wonderful conference, I, my first reaction was, ah, talking about Marx again. You know, haven't we said it all? Hasn't it all, it all been said before? You know, what 
possibly could I say that it hasn't been, I, you know, David Harvey or various, Henri Lefebvre or various other people haven't said. So uh, it, it, it becomes, not so close. Not so close. It becomes um, somewhat difficult to know what, what to say about Marxism. It, it, it's a lot easier, I think, to say things about the city. Um, but frankly, neither Marxism nor the city, as I see it, are in terrific shape. <laughs> it's not the great time to talk about one or the other. The Marxism is not a la mode. It's, it's, it's not exactly flavor of the month or in vogue for a lot of people. The city that I see and the cities that I know best are London and New York tend to be pale reflections on perhaps what I once knew them being like on the one hand. So I do have a bit of a nostalgia for the 1970s and 1980s, grim as they were as decades. Uh, culturally, politically, I have, a lot of, I have a lot of nostalgia for that generation. But I also just think that the, you know, the, the way in which these cities now are pricing people out are themselves incredibly uninteresting for me, just full of the same, at least when I walk around central London, full of the same kinds of multinational chains. The office blocks have the same multinational accountancy firms, the same banks, the same usual suspects seem to colonize all the great space of the city. So not only are they exploiting the land rents of the city, but they're also dispatching some of the poorer people out of the city. So cities become, it becomes a double whammy. Cities become places where a lot of poorer people, even middle class people, are displaced from. And they become exploitable for the wealthy. But at the end of the day, they become really kind of uninteresting. For me anyway, as somebody who was brought up reading Andre Breton and the Surrealist about novelty and adventure and cities being places of unexpected encounter and being brought up with Guy Debord and his derives and wandering, aimless wandering through cities to discover all these little niches and dark and, and, and particularly uh, um, underground little neighborhoods that made the cities really interesting and really vital and also affordable too. They were cheap, you know, you could afford to live there. You could afford to live there in grungy affordability. But now I see, I see that no longer possible. So the obvious thing that enters my mind is, well, you know, what, what can Marxism offer about that? On the one hand, what can it offer to critique the situation? And I think it needs to develop a, a different kind of Marxism in a sense, because what we're seeing now with a lot of displaced people the world over, and they include obviously people who are displaced through various climate changes, economic crises, refugees displaced from uh, wild regimes as well as wildfires, that we're seeing a lot of people who now are somehow residual to this urban process, who have to try and make ends meet. And many of them don't have places to go to work. So they're no longer the working class in the sense that Marx thought about them being people who are displaced from work. Of course, people are being displaced from work. People are being displaced from work all the time. The factory work is still ongoing. The global working class often isn't in places uh, that, we, that Engels spoke about in the developing countries. It's often elsewhere, it's in China. The participants are women. So we have a, a recomposition of, a, of the working class and a class that no longer has work, but is clearly part of the working class too. It's not only displaced from work, but it's displaced from dwelling space, from the right to the city, for the right to the affordable housing, for the right to afford to live in the city, let alone to work in the city. And if there is work, often it's doing very menial work and doing many, many different kinds of jobs menial work and having to travel vast distances to do that work at one's own expense. So the, the, the stake for me then is to think about you know, what can Marxism do to address this issue of the city? Because for me, it's always been, it's always been some of the best Marxists and the best Marxism, the, best, the most interesting Marxist thinkers that have done urban research just at the same time a lot of the, the most interesting 
research has been, of, the, of the city has been done by Marxists. Now for me, I'm a bit of a depressive Marxist, I have to say. I go in fits and cyclical long waves of, of elation and depression. A few years ago, you know, around about Occupy, and what was going on here in Madrid and what was going on in, in Athens, there was, there was a cyclical upsurge of, 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 of hope and, and optimism. And I think a lot of that hope and optimism uh, was, was beginning to address the, eco the economic crisis of 2008. But what we found now, I think, seven, six years, seven years on from Occupy, that period of the early 2010, 2011, when it looked like the activism and dissent was re-energizing the city, reanimating some of the urban spaces, and coming up with quite an interesting political agenda that we could broadly interpret as being Marxist, that seems to have, it seems to have dissipated a little bit. It seems to have lost some momentum. It seems to have lost a lot of its protagonists, a lot of the fire, a lot of the hope. Now for me, I've always been a bit inspired by different kinds of Marxism. On the one hand, one of the, one of the books I wrote about during this period of sort of Occupy 2011 was a book called Magical Marxism. I don't know whether anybody has ever read that wonderful little paragraph by Edward Galeano, the Uruguayan poet, writer, called Magical Marxism. And he said, you know, why don't we found a, a new kind of Marxism, a magical Marxism, one half reason, one half passion, and a third half mystery. And the guy said, yeah, so let's go for it. Three halves to this, to this, to this magical Marxism. And I wanted to subscribe to that particular brand of Marxism. I probably would fill in that third half with, with hope, because I think hope is a very important thing. I noticed very recently that Subcommandant Marcos has just published in English a, a, a book of his writings. And the, the title of the book is called The Professionals of Hope. And I really like that title in a world which is dominated by professionalization of the occupations, particularly of, of the, the professions such as, such as uh, accountancy, such as academia, such as different walks of life where one has to earn a career if one doesn't want to be a loser. And I, this idea of professionals of hope is the only kind of profession I really, really want to buy into. But to have hope, I think you also need to have a particular kind of sense of humor too. So there is another brand of Marxism that occasionally I aspire to, uh, espouse to, and that is, is a, a Groucho Marxism, which follows loosely the irony of the American comedian Groucho Marx by saying, you know, I don't really want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. Which in a sense sounds like a very, very anti-Marxist statement, one of the anti-collective. But I think, to keep hope alive, one needs to be ironic, and one needs to be, have a certain sense of humor with that too. So I, I wouldn't want Marxists to lose the sense of irony, nor the sense of hope, and nor the sense of a magical notion that things can happen, even when things don't look to be happening. Because I guess there is another kind of Marxism, it's, all, it's almost a Beckett Marxism, you know, Samuel Beckett, the fairly depressive Irish playwright, you know, when he says about, I can't go on, I, I, I won't go on, I'll go on. Or he says something about, you know, fail, f try again, try better, fail better. It strikes me that some of those clarion calls are very much part of the Marxist, Marxist tradition. You know, we need to try and fail better. We need to fail better. Long ago, Lenin posed the question, what is to be done? I haven't got a clue, really, what is to be done about Marxism, nor about the city. But it does strike me a little bit that the question maybe needs to be at this particular conjuncture. When neoliberal capitalism is rampant, when Marxist critique has probably never been more applicable than ever, we need to adjust the, the idea that it's the, what the constitution of the working class is, that it includes dwelling space, it, it includes reproductive space, but it also includes the workplace too. But we need to think about 
how perhaps Marxists can begin again. It sounds like a depressing thing to say, but we may have to think about reconstituting some of the old questions, some of the old questions about what are the working classes? What is the city that doesn't seem to be the factory city? It doesn't seem to be productive of value. In fact, the city seems to be incredibly, um, almost extractive and parasitic of the forms of surplus value that Marx was talking about in how somehow surplus value derives from exploitation broadly at the workplace through some form of commodity production. Surplus labor constitutes surplus value. Profit is generated from putting commodities in motion. Capital is circulating, extracting value from that. Cities don't seem to be productive of value. They seem to be just full of people drinking coffee, you know, and often drinking coffee at the same chains, the same Starbucks, certainly in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world, and, and drinking coffee and not doing very much work. And it seems to be the people who are drinking this coffee seem to be quite wealthy. You know, how the, how the fucking hell are they gaining their wealth? They don't seem to be doing it through the traditional methods of, of, of exploitation of the workplace, or else they are linked in some way to that, but it is so displaced by various different forms of mediation, often it's done many, many thousands of miles away, that we perhaps need to think about the city again as, a, as an accumulation process. How does it relate to Marx's theory of, of um, general law of a capitalist accumulation from chapter 25 of Capital, or even the working day from chapter 10? that it strikes me now that that relative surplus population isn't necessarily just coming from the world of work, but it's coming from the, the whole totality of neoliberal life in the city and in the countryside. To the degree we've got our cities expanding, growing bigger and bigger, yet the particular kinds of lives that people are leading, their forms of individuality, if you like, the possibilities to realize themselves as total men, as total human beings, as Marx said in the early manuscripts, seems to be shrinking too. So the questions there then are, what do we do with this constituency now that we can call a, a, a residue, a residual element to neoliberal capitalism that seems to be living neither in the traditional city nor in the traditional countryside? seems to be doing work which is no longer traditionally staked out by Marxist, by Marxist thinkers, or rarely is it done. How can we think about, on the one hand, organizing this group of residual people? Henri Lefebvre talks about a residual in, in a, a book called Metaphilosophy. He makes this idea that every totality, every totalizing system and I think we can think about neoliberal capitalism as being a, a particular kind of hegemonic project. That if we go around different cities of the world and we talk to people in power, I think pretty much they have the same things on their mind about what is going to work and who should, be, who should be leading it and what kind of cities matter to them and who should be the people who are living in those cities, you know, whether they be the creative classes of Richard Florida or whether they be full of spectacular architecture and have you know, some fancy museum constructed somewhere. There's an orthodoxy that we can say is a particular totalizing process. But Henri Lefebvre always said that with any totalizing process, there's always some leakage. There's always some slippage. There's always slippage about people who don't fit in, aren't allowed to fit in, don't want to fit in never want to fit in, never want to be a part of that club that will have them as a member. And this is the constituency that Henri Lefebvre talks about as being the residue. And he uses the word secreted. They are secreted from the, from the totality. So we can see how cities now use and abuse incredible amounts of resources, sucking people from no matter where, sucking culture, sucking information, sucking wealth and power and then they use it to channel some form of growth, and then what they don't need, what is superfluous to this process, is then evacuated, evicted, displaced, expelled, 
You can name all the different words for expulsion, but it's a form of secretion now that is there whether people in power want it or not. And it's not gonna go away. And it is some latent force that sometimes is swinging to the right and isn't saying things that we would hope they would be saying because it is, its constituency is variegated. It's motley. It's made up of assorted, disparate people. Some people actually are middle class people. Some of them are refugees, utterly brutalized and poor by particular kinds of, of places they've been to, whether they be regimes, economic regimes, or whether they be subject to some form of, envi of, of war or environmental disaster. But there's also a lot of refugees of normal everyday life who can't afford to find work, who can't afford to pay the rent, who can't afford to buy housing, who are floating around somewhere without any kind of party to belong to, without anybody to represent them. And so we get them as floating people who are very manipulable for particular forms of capitalist media who say certain things which sound quite obvious to them. You know, there's no work, but there's a lot of immigrants. Why don't we get rid of the immigrants? Therefore, we'll solve that problem. Britain pays 350 million to the European Union every week. What could that do if we didn't pay it to the European Union? These were the kind of lies that were peddled in the, in the UK on the, on the, on the, before the, the Brexit vote. And not that I was a big fan of the European Union, I might add, but it's clear that nobody was ready for what has happened, and there's been no voice to fill that. The working class has no party anymore. It has no representative. So perhaps in that beginning again, that question that I just want to pose and finish with, we could maybe think about what would constitute the rebuilding of a party again? How can we get some bold representatives to come out and represent the people, to speak for the people, to formulate a dictatorship of the proletariat? Jesus, there's a lot of them around. There's more than probably in Marx's day. The problem is, you know, I think, is stop listening to the news. You'd be wiser about what's going on. It's clear now that to begin again, the Marxist critical tradition needs some form of dispersion of information. And I actually don't believe that social media is the right place to do it. I'm, I'm an advocate of old media, face-to-face -face interactions, face-to-face -face truths, face-to-face -face encounters. That was what cities were meant to be about. They weren't behind sitting in the screens, alienated. They were about people encountering other people. Create spaces where people can do that. They can talk to other people. And then the word can get out. You know, the old neighborhoods in Greenwich Village, you know, were talking about poets and about and creating Village Voice newspaper, but they were also talking about war in Vietnam. They had an, an outlook which was progressive, which was global. So think about how old media now, newspapers, organizers, particular kinds of places where people can hang out. It's inevitably gonna begin again, I think, if it begins. I don't know if it's gonna begin again. I hope it'll begin again. We can try to make it begin again. But it is going to come from some form of underground, from the periphery, maybe somewhere like this. This is peripheral enough. The periphery of the cities, people who are living peripheral lives, even if they're living in the core. I live in the core, but I find myself a participant and, and a rank and filer of the, of the periphery. I think like the periphery. I feel peripheral. I don't want any of this. I don't like what I see. I feel like Rockantan in Sartre's Nausea. When I ever see a skyscraper in, a, in, in, in Manhattan, and I see a, a nice place which doesn't want me in there, I feel a nausea about it. It makes me angry, and I want to do something about it, but I don't know what to do about it. Often I just trottle off, go home, and get a bit depressed, read Marx, read Andre Breton. There's a whole wealth of material we could be doing there, but I think the underground needs to start again. Old Mole was called Old Mole for a reason. Let's get thinking about that here, thinking about how we can begin again to reclaim the city and to reclaim a kind of Marxism that can address what we've got now are all around us. Thank you. Pues muchas gracias también por tu intervención. Eh, a ver si hay mm, alguna 
palabra desde la sala. Quería también comentar que, bueno, pues como el Congreso se ha hecho con muchas áreas distintas que todas están funcionando a la vez, pues eh, las, eh, todas las, eh, las intervenciones más globales que necesitaban traducción todas las hemos hecho aquí y que se, están, se graban y se están retransmitiendo en streaming las, las eh, charlas que hacemos aquí. Eh, bueno, dicho esto, ¿hay alguien que quiera comentar, preguntar, decir algo al respecto de las dos intervenciones? ¿No? Sí, sí. Hay, hay, hay traducción, o sea que casi mejor… Ah, bueno, a lo que quieras, pero nos lo van a traducir. Sí, ah, sí, pero… Sí. Sí, sí. Sí, sí. Ah, es, que, es que tienes que hablar al micrófono para que te oiga el, el traductor. No sé. Okay, so yes, trying to, uh, I'm trying to put in order my, my thoughts, um, trying to bring together because I, first of all, let me say that I enjoyed your, your uh, talks a lot, even if they were so different from each other, uh, but both Costis's um, attempt to, to reconstruct like the history of the concept and how different strands of Marxism have added to, to it and then uh, Andy uh, talking much more about the, the present and the present dilemmas of both Marx Marxism and, and the left. And I was wondering, um, um, a way to join the two talks together and ask you the same question at the same time. Um, Costis was talking about um, the difficulty or, uh, of, of um, assessing space in social sciences generally, both in Marxism and in, in general. And I was thinking that uh, perhaps in, from the epistemological point of view in the social sciences, political sciences, uh, space has not, has not been like uh, a main feature for a long time. So most of the um, trends you were talking about were sort of uh, peripheral or marginal. But even if the social sciences uh, were not able to uh, properly address this problem, capital knows how to use, has proved to show, has shown how to use capital through history. I mean, even if it was difficult for us to understand both in our field or in our uh, part of the trenches and for the enemies, and I mean, we're here close to the uh, School of Economy, where, as you know, space is not usually uh, taken into account. You were talking about the current or recent crisis in the, U in the UA, and uh, you were saying that space was not taken into account, and that was a difficulty to solve the crisis, but at the same time, from another point of view, space was, in a way, the strategy they were using to enter the crisis and take advantage of the crisis. So, so social scientists, geographers, um, urban scholars um, have been dealing with this issue for a long time with many difficulties. At the same time, capital policymakers have been using space very cleverly uh, through history and especially since the 1980s to take advantage of these patterns of uneven development. Then moving to what Andy was saying, um, you were talking about the residues, these uh, surplus populations, the moles, uh, that could be the opportunity to turn things upside down and start doing some real uh, things. At the same time, 
again, I, I would say that it is precisely the problem that we uh, sometimes have in describing, for instance, what is the speciality in the production of this uh, sort of surplus po population. We know the processes, I mean, we, we can understand the processes, especially uh, people working in the Marxist uh, tradition can explain how land rent uh, works, um, we can explain how an even development uh, works. It's much more difficult to explain how capital has disorganized these populations in time, which is a, a key aspect to be able to do something or to reorganize in the terms that you were uh, referring to. So my, my point is, um, yes, we have a tradition of trying to deal with this aspect. At the same time, at this point, I think that the main, um, uh, the main features or, or those features that are ex precisely helpful to build a kind of resistance, uh, we're missing them. We are not able to describe them. And in a way, this is, our, this is the main weakness uh, we have right now. Meanwhile, others in the opposite political field, conservatives, <coughs> the far right, are taking advantage of space right now to build political discourse, especially in Europe. I mean, while we are unable to understand how this disorganization of the working class, citizens, whatever you may uh, call it, while we are uh, having these difficulties, the right is, uh, has been able to uh, take advantage of the uh, situation and build another discourse where, for instance, nation is again very meaningful. And, and they are using it as a platform to grow in many countries, in, the, in Europe and, and elsewhere. Do you get my point? This is a far, I mean, and it, I know this is very meandering, no, no, uh, but my point is, uh, yes, we've been dealing with space for a long time, yet I don't think we have uh, the tools to grasp those aspects of space that are especially productive right now to build an alternative, an, an alternative political discourse. Meanwhile, capital in history and right now, right-wing formations have been very clever and smart in using it to disorganize the working class and now to try to reorganize these residues, these peripheries, in a project that is unfortunately not, uh, of course, progressive at all. Does that make sense? It makes sense, it makes perfect sense. So much sense that I'll let Costis answer it. We collect the questions sure. and we answer Tien all together or... Sí, es que quería, es, es, un poco, es un poco discrepando mínimamente, mínimamente con, con Álvaro. Yo no creo que el problema del, del marxismo esté en el marxismo como ciencia, porque nos falten los instrumentos conceptuales o metodológicos para, para entender. Yo creo que la derrota del marxismo ha, ha ocurrido en que ha, ha, se, ha, se ha producido por la pérdida de hegemonía en la vida cotidiana. Y entonces, la, 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 el, el cambio del marxismo, lo, eh, el, el nuevo marxismo que tiene que venir, tiene que recuperar esa hegemonía en la vida cotidiana. Y creo que los intentos que está haciendo la izquierda para esa, para esa recuperación está tergiversando el marxismo, está reproduciendo la fragmentación que es la, precisamente la herramienta que ha tenido el capitalismo para cargarse la hegemonía del, del, del marxismo en ambas. En relación a este mismo tema, hay algo. ¿Tú quieres contestar, Álvaro? ¿Quieres tú Sí, sí, o sea, efectivamente no somos capaces, eh, hemos perdido, o se ha perdido esa hegemonía en ciertos sectores de la población, pero lo que, lo que quería yo decir precisamente es que la hemos perdido porque no somos capaces de comprender la desorganización de la vida cotidiana que el capital ha producido durante las últimas décadas. Entonces, eh, Estoy de acuerdo contigo en que el problema es más práctico y político que científico, 
Pero en el campo científico, estamos en la universidad y al fin y al cabo pues, se trata también de comprender y, y sobre todo la, la intervención de Costis iba en, esa, iba en esa línea, yo creo que en el campo científico también tenemos serias dificultades para comprender toda esa fragmentación eh, que se ha producido y en consecuencia somos incapaces de, de producir la respuesta en términos propiamente políticos. Um, I think I agree with uh, both comments from a different angle, however. Uh, yes, Alvaro, you are absolutely correct that um, uh, dominant classes and including far, far right, far wing right, um, is using space for their own benefits and uh, to increase its own uh, interest. So I was speaking in terms of demanding the reaccession of space into the left-wing thinking so that uh, at least uh, people that are struggling in uh, squares, uh, streets, and different places could really influence the way uh, of thinking of, let's say, people in the left that are taking decisions. And I can use, let's say, uh, my example from Greece to strengthen these points that unfortunately uh, Syriza in power, of course, with coalition, with a uh, far right wing, small uh, party, very nationalistic one, which is using uh, space on the national agenda to promote uh, its own interest. I mean, they never took seriously uh, all the lessons of uh, the early years of crisis in Greece to understand how important, first of all, was daily life. I mean, people were reacting and demonstrating because of daily life, not just, I mean, of the old vulgarist uh, demand uh, that we were used to wait, let's say, for people demonstrating. And second, that the whole crisis of the Eurozone and uh, the European Union is still, is still dominate the view of a very simple economism, that everything depends on the economic of uh, uh, the Euro, the economic of uh, the debt, and uh, the economic of, uh, uh, let's say, trade relations. And they don't see at all, first of all, that it is a result of a very long process of uneven development, which didn't start, it, let's say, in 2008 and 2010. The crisis started 30 years before. And uh, the introduction of the euro made it uh, definitely more severe. And finally, they don't see the construction of the eurozone as uh, a new space, as a new hybrid space, as I call it, and scale, which is absolutely necessary for the financial forces. And of course, it is less necessary for the people, uh, let's say, in their own daily life, apart that they have, let's say, a strong currency, which they cannot use it in the same way as the Germans or as the Northerners, because it's not their own country. It is a, it is a, it is a uh, let's say, a currency that has been imposed. And now everybody in Southern Europe, they feel that we are, let's say, uh, clients of uh, the business class, so let's uh, behave the same way. So it's not that. So I believe that uh, both space has been used very actively from the dominant classes and less by left-wing people. And secondly, yes, we have lost the battle on the daily life scale. I mm. fully agree with that. I, I can say something if you like. Um, I, I quite agree with Costi, so I think it's, that was a very nice analysis. I think on the one hand, you know, people in power, ruling classes, have know full well how to use space. And in fact, the quote that Costi uses, the one from Survival of Capitalism, says it all. You know, 
we can't calculate what the cost has been, but we know the means, you know, through producing space, through, through occupying space, and uh, they've done that very well. And on the other hand, I think in doing that, they, you know, they've, they've colonized everyday life and with gadgets and ads and all kinds of things that go on in social media that are dangled in front of people and people want them. So, you know, they've been manipulated through media. I mean, I, it's, I won't go as far as to say false consciousness, but it, I would certainly use a, an Althusserian notion of ideology that they have been hailed, hey you, and they know it's them, and they've accepted that ideological hailing. Uh, the distortion of whether the left has distorted everyday life, um, yes, yes and no, I think it's complicated. I think that part of the answer is the ruling classes have, have colonized everyday life. Uh, that's one response. Secondly is that the left didn't know quite what to do with itself in the 1970s. Um, you know, the, the, the demise of the Communist Party is, has been a, a problem, and a lot of the time it was, it was the Communist Party's fault. Certainly with the French Communist Party, I know most about. You know, when it gave up the idea of a dictatorship of the proletariat in 1976 at the party conference, uh, Althusser wrote some really great pieces about that, saying whether the Marche was doing the right thing, and this was the era of Euro-communism. And it's very interesting to look at how many Euro-communists became first-wave neoliberalizers, how they use their managerialist position within the state, and the, and the French state under Mitterrand is fantastic for looking at how the state, the state, the people who are members of, of the state, the politicians, suddenly then became these neoliberal business people. So instead of being entrepreneurial managers, they became managerial entrepreneurs. And that changed the whole dynamic of, certainly, of the, the nation state and its political life. The demise of the working class through post-industrialization, the demise of the unions in the 1980s, certainly where I came from, you know, with Thatcher and the United States and the Reagan, it's had a catastrophic effect that, say, you know, set the seeds for what we're still living under. And it, it, it wasn't dealt with very well by the left. So did the left distort it? No, I just don't think it knew what to do with itself. I think in certain times it hasn't been courageous. Certain times it's been too uh, courageous. Certain times it's capitulated. Certain times it shouldn't have capitulated. So it's, it's a very close run thing to know exactly what's happening. I think there's certainly the generation there I'm looking at now, I think we've lived long enough to have a, a long wave, and with Costis as well, we've got a long wave notion of what's happened here. And if I look elsewhere, other people don't, who are a different generation. But I think it's very important that we don't forget where we came from, that there is a tradition out there that was battling in the 1970s and the 1960s, and I guess even 1930s, although they're not, they're not here now, most of them. That we're saying things which are still worth listening to. And the secret of young scholars who call themselves Marxists is to think how they can adapt those in their own daily life, in their own professional life, but in their own class life with other people. And that is, it's, that is the way in which maybe we can begin again. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's an incredible resilient mode of thinking, Marxism. <laughs> A lot of people wish it would go away. It's 200 years anniversary, it's lasted a long time. To think that Marx was writing these amazing things when he was 26, you know, the economic and philosophical manuscripts. There's hope for young people to have a look at those and see if you can do better, fail better. Yo quería indagar un poco en este aspecto de, de hacer que aflore lo underground, que has planteado como una vía eh, posible de renovación. Y eh, he tenido en mi clase invitado hace unos días un arquitecto que está trabajando en Santiago de Chile con un colectivo de prostitutas, de trabajadoras sexuales, como ya se les gusta llamarse, y lo que describía era un proceso de apropiación de una manzana en el centro, en el casco histórico de Santiago de Chile, que convivía con otros procesos económicos, pero que de alguna forma era un residuo 
del, del sistema inmobiliario que estaba transformando otras partes de la ciudad. Y una de las necesidades que ellas eh, planteaban, que eran, surgían especialmente claras, eran lugares de, donde podían intercambiar. Es decir, en el fondo eh, lo que necesitaban era socializar en el espacio público, apropiarse de otros espacios que fueran colectivos, ya no fueran individuales porque eran los sitios donde ellas ejercían su profesión, los sitios a los que habían logrado acceder y por lo tanto se habían apropiado de ellos. Y curiosamente uno de los vectores de apropiación del espacio público era una visión ambientalista. Y mi pregunta va un poco en ese sentido, ¿qué, qué penséis vosotros que puede ser la sinergia entre una visión ecológica de los procesos, que en el fondo son eh, esencialmente espaciales, no se puede entender la ecología sin entenderla desde el punto de vista espacial. No, no se puede hacer esa abstracción, igual que se puede hacer abstracción con los modos de producción, no se puede hacer eso con eh, el metabolismo urbano, por ejemplo. ¿no? Y, y que de alguna forma muchas personas lo visualizan como un mecanismo de apropiación que iría un poco en el sentido de aflorar esta, estos residuos que permite el sistema o que deja el sistema. That's a very good question. The, 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 the story from Chile is very interesting. Um, that is an underground, it's clear. Uh, you know, the underground needs its space. It needs its, uh, its way in which it can maybe push upwards to the overground. I don't know whether that metaphor is going to go. But certainly the ecological problem does produce strange... Um, possibilities for cities. Now, it's hard to imagine that the United States is something to which you can look at upon being optimistic, <laughs> given, given what's going on there now. But one of, the, one of the fascinating things that's going on is when Donald Trump refused to sign the Paris Accord, the Climate Change Accord, Global Warming, a lot of the American cities decided that they would adhere to it, they would support it. So I think now that there's, and they've gone against the federal government in the name of a city, and the particular ways in which American politics operates, cities have a lot more autonomy. They certainly have a lot more autonomy than they do in, in the UK, when cities really have no autonomy to make their own decisions, to generate their own budget. They're very, it's a very centralized system, like it is in France, governed by Whitehall. But I think now the whole climate change debate is throwing up some interesting possibilities for cities in terms of their mode of governance. Now, if, imagine if people just thought of being citizens of the polis, like they did way before Costis was around in his part of the world. And just imagine that there were no nation states, that if you just belonged to the city and you saw your political viewpoint as being a citoyen, citoyenne even, that you, could, you would be a citadin, a citadin, you would be a member of the city. You would belong to the city. The city was your political focus, political governance. The people who ruled the, rule the, the cities were your, were, your, were your people who were supposed to be representing you and you keep them on their toes. That you get some more of a, an imaginative way in which we could, which the, the whole political jurisdictional configuration, spatiality could be changed to prioritize cities within that. And it, it's, 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 it's clear to me, I think it's clear to me, that a lot of the constituent ingredients of the public spaces of the city then would have to be much more eco-sensitive. I'm not just talking about in terms of seawater levels, that will have to happen too, because a meter rise of seawater is going to plunge millions of people underwater, including thousands of cities who are precariously placed, and the most precarious citizens are going to be exposed more to that phenomenon, to the degree we're now already seeing the rich building upwards because they know sea level climate changes is going to engulf a lot of people, so they're building, their resilience is to build up, is to barricade themselves from it, to protect themselves from it above ground. But the underground can use the eco ticket as part of its, as part of its as part of, its, a part, a part of it ammunition, because it's clear that we can't have a resilient city if it's excluding the bulk of the population. 
There has to be some inclusive form of citizenship that can really develop a resilient city. How can a, resilient, how can a city be resilient when a lot of people are excluded from the democracy of it, when there is no democracy about the decisions? So I, I do think that the climate change debate, I probably haven't answered the question directly, does place many threats to us, of course, but it does open up a few perhaps possibilities about how the underground can wedge within that and produce a different thinking about how to rule a city. Si no hay, ya, ya es la hora de, de irnos, si no hay ninguna cosa más urgente, pues eh, cerramos la sesión. Yo un, un poco con la sensación de la crisis de, del marxismo y la crisis de la ciudad, pero esperemos que podamos tomar este concepto de crisis más como, como reactivación del pensamiento que como catástrofe y podamos iniciar de aquí en adelante bueno, pues otro nuevo pensamiento sobre, sobre las dos cosas. Eh, esta tarde la, nos han cambiado la sala y no estamos en, en la prevista. Lo malo es que no me sé, el, el, sé que estamos en el sótano, pero no me acuerdo del, del, del nombre de la sala. O sea, que lo pondremos en la anterior, en la puerta de la anterior, pondremos la, en la donde, donde nos reunimos. El, nos reuníamos la B55, pues allí tiene que pongan un cartel diciendo en qué sala estamos. Sé que es en el sótano, pero no sé qué sala es. Muchas gracias a todos y específicamente a Andy Costis por su esfuerzo y por haber estado con nosotros aquí. <risa>